Hello and welcome to Socially Distant Discover Nature, episode 9? Perhaps. Well, this is new. We are filming. <coughs> Sorry, I say that like I have a team of experts behind me. I am filming in the evening. So rather than our normal race against time before the midday sun and untimely incineration, now we're kind of racing in pending darkness. And also I've just eaten a massive slab of chocolate cake, so we'll probably be having a sugar low in about 20 minutes. So hopefully that'll keep us brisk and to the point. Onwards. I promised a fairly easy romp through some common wildflowers, and we'll get to that in a few moments. But first of all, our usual catch up. Emma McKenzie, the creative writing tutor on the Eco Therapy Programme at St. Nick's, has been out and about and she snapped a picture of a tansy beetle. This is also going to provide an opportunity to have a closer look at some tansy leaves, because I don't think I did a very good job last week of, of showing you what to look out for. I've got it growing in my garden, so I filmed some of the, the leaves in the breeze. Lovely, lovely. But it just gives you an idea of, of what you're looking for when you're out and about in York, near the River Ouse, looking for tansy plants. This is what you're trying to see. And once you've found that, then you start looking for the shiny green beetles. And also some lovely other wildflowers. So we've got some buttercups here. This uh, kind of uh, bottle brush style plant is bistort, some sort of bistort. I'm presuming it's common bistort. I probably need to kind of gaze at it with a wildflower book just to make sure it's not something else like amphibious bistort, slightly different. And also this lovely little pink flower, this is Herb Robert. I don't know if you can hear, but Beaky is out there. Beaky is singing his heart out. Next up, we've got solitary bees. So apologies to Jimmy. Jimmy sent in these photographs and this little film of red mason bees nesting in his wall uh, two, two weeks ago. Forgot to include it in the previous episode. Very sorry. Here it is now and it's very much appreciated. We've also had Sean send in this incredible photo of a solitary bee. It's a type of nomad bee, but unfortunately you can't determine the species without dissection. So we'll just leave it a mystery, but according to Sean it could be either a Panzer's nomad bee or a Flavus nomad bee. And I do hope I pronounced those two words correctly. Next up we've got a stealth camera bonanza. So if you remember Simon and Judith from Kent in a previous episode sent us some footage they caught of a deer and a fox, or well, now they've got footage of a badger. Including this very brief clip of a badger wiping its bottom on a stick. Now what I think it's doing here is scent marking. It's got a, a gland towards the end, a musk gland. All mustelids have them, so uh, pine martins, otters. Beaky, seriously, I am trying to record here. Surely I've fed you enough raisins that you can chill for a bit. Apparently I can never feed him enough raisins. What was I saying? Badgers, scent marking, yes. Ooh, you'll get yours, Beaky. You'll get yours. Right, I have words. Also experimenting with stealth cameras is Meg from York, who's managed to capture these photographs of a hedgehog that's coming into her garden, and potentially using her hedgehog box as well. So could be a permanent resident, which is excellent news. So we've had solitary bees, stealth cameras. Let's stick with the theme of things beginning with S and look at uh, some forget-me-nots. Sorry. 
So Ivana from St. Nick's has sent us in photographs of really blue forget-me-nots and some different coloured forget-me-nots. There's an example here of some particularly pale forget-me-nots and Ivana suggested it might be due to the soil type. I don't actually know, I uh, haven't managed to find a convincing answer. Some uh, brief googling has suggested that some blue forget-me-nots can turn pink as they age potentially indicating the flowers are less suitable for pollination, but um, it's all unconfirmed, so if you do know anything about forget-me-nots, get in touch with an answer. We would be very grateful. Thank you very much. We've also had Jack send in a photograph of a sea of forget-me-nots. Absolutely incredible. Well, that's all from the catch-up, but as is tradition now, we'll head over to Genghis Morazapan, who is on uh, probation due to general lack of success, shall we say, in a, a polite term. But he's found something that he can do. He can show us a special guest. So, over to you, Genghis. It's not actually over there. I could have looked up there, or that way, or down. Breaking the fourth wall! Yes, hello! Genghis Marazapan here, wildlife roving reporter. And I've got something that, yes, I can do quite easily. Uh, your eagle-eyed viewer has spotted a couple of paws on some of my posts. And yes, he wants to see my dog, who I have with me. Uh, she's called Shesmerelda, and she's often here to help me out. Um, and of course, I can show her. So, if you just hang on a second, she's sitting right next to me, best behaved dog in the world. In the in ah, oh. damn, she's gone off after those sheep again. Shes up, shes up, shes up, shes up, shes up. Back to you, shes up. Well, I can't say I'm overly surprised that he can't even show his own dog. But yeah, I have no more words. Let's move on. So now on to the main section of the show, and I promised you some easy wildflower identification. So what I've done is, most of the clips I'm going to show you I've filmed while out and about, and I think you'll agree, or I hope you do, I've done a slightly better job uh, than Genghis does. Jury's probably still out. I've tried to pick flowers that are numerous and common, so hopefully if you're going out on your socially distant walks, exercise events, you'll be able to encounter them too. The second thing I've done is I've tried to choose flowers that you can identify purely just by looking at them. So you don't need to root through a flower guidebook, an identification key, in theory, these are ones that you can just go, right, yes, know what that is, I'm pretty much 99% sure. Flower number one to look out for is white dead nettle. White dead nettle is part of the Lamiaceae family, which have several features to look out for, which is a kind of square-sided stem. So the stem's got four sides, and if you cut it in half, the cross section would look like a square. They also have what are known as opposite leaves. So these are leaves on each side of the stem in pairs. Also to look out for the flower is a really interesting shape and it's made up of what they call two lips, which forms quite a, oh, quite a complex structure. If you get a close look at it, it looks incredible. This is white dead nettle, as you can see, no sting at all. Leaves are kind of a rich green colour, these lovely white lobe flowers in a sort of uh, ring candelabra around the stem. The stem, you can see... It's kind of, well, maybe you can't see. Take my word for it that it's a square stem. It's got four sides to it. Ooh. 
quite uh, fuzzy felt texture to the leaves. There's some more. But you need to be careful what you're touching because it's growing right next to actual nettles, which you've got darker colour leaves, a more jaggedy, vicious looking edge. The stem, not that you want to touch it, is more rounded. So, real nettles. White dead nettle. Lots of real nettles. Everywhere. White dead nettle never grows in such a huge monoculture, at least not in my experience. The second flower to look out for is also in the Lamiaceae family, and it's very, very similar. It's red dead nettle. Again, it's got the four-sided square stems, it's got lobed flowers, this time they're a kind of bright pink magenta. In my experience, it can be a lot smaller, although I guess it, d it depends what, what habitat it's growing in. The leaves often can have a, a reddish tint to them sometimes as well. And the flowers are kind of in a circle around the stem and the stem is square sided so you chop it in half it's got a square cross section and straight sides there we go if you've not seen white dead nettle or red dead nettle you might be familiar with the lamiaceae family regardless because it includes mint so if you've got any mint growing out in your garden, pet out now, grab it, give the stem a good feel, see if it's got a kind of four-sided stem with a square cross section. Good ID feature. Our next flower to look out for is red campion. And rather boringly, it's in the campion family. Absolutely loads of this growing in my garden at the moment and I harvested the seeds with landowner permission from the Lower Derwent Valley National Nature Reserve at their Wildlife Garden Centre Bank Island in Weldrake. It grows very tall. It's got these lovely pink flowers. And you can see the hairiness to it. I also want to thank Sean for sending in this photograph of a female red campion flower where you can see the stigmas. I want to talk a bit more about some of the structure of the, the red campion plant slash flower. Botany is not my strong point, so I'm going to read some terms out. So we've got the petals, which are very obvious, they're pink. Now below the petals you have a whirl of leaf-like structures. These are called sepals. In red campion the sepals are quite a dark almost maroon colour and they're joined together as a whole they're called the calyx and they form, because they're kind of fused, a calyx tube. So this calyx tube, this tube of sepals, is quite long relative to the, the flower. It's quite long, dark, maroonish colour, and it's got sticky hairs on it as well. This is a good thing to look out for. There are other types of campion, quite a few. There's white campion, very similar to red campion, but it has white flowers and the, the sepals, the calyx tube, it doesn't have the maroon tinge to it. Confusion arises because there's quite a lot of variation within red campion. They can be the sort of magenta rose pink all the way down to a lot paler pink. And even worse is that red campion and white campion can create hybrids, which are sort of intermediate colours. If you're out and about and you see a white campion plant and it looks like the calyx tube has been inflated to look like a bladder, then it's going to be bladder campion. Now, as I've said, I'm not very good at botany, but my go-to book is The Wildflower Key by Francis Rose. Highly recommend getting this. Try and get the latest edition. 
Very good. It's helped me out of many a plant-based pickle. And all pickles are made from plants. So there we go. The metaphor is falling down, so we'll quickly move on. Plant number four to look out for is cuckoo flower. I'm going to give you the last name for cuckoo flower, which is cardamine pretensis. I've avoided too much Latin scientific names to overload you with, but the reason I'm giving you cardamine pretensis is because cuckoo flower has many different common names across the country. So it's also known as Mayflower, um, Lady Smock, Milkmaids, and probably many more. Cuckoo flower is a member of the cabbage family. Now, traditionally, I don't associate beautiful things with cabbages, but that's probably my own personal failing. So the cabbage family, brassicae, bra... Oh, not again. I'm going to call it brassicaceae, but if someone wants to send me a correct pronunciation, pronunciation, how to say it, please do. Also known as the crucifer family. Typical characteristic, as you can see in the cuckoo flower, is it's got flowers have four petals, four petals, and they form a cross shape. As in uh, crucifix, crucified, that's a bit morbid, forget that one. Cuckoo flower is known as such because it flowers at a similar time to when you might hear the cuckoos arriving. Although cuckoos are very rare, we did see last week Tracy sent us a recording of a cuckoo, and we've got cuckoo flower out now, so that lines up quite nicely. Also known as Mayflower for the obvious reason that it's the month of May in which it majority of it flowers. If you're looking out for this, you want to be looking in wet areas. So I've seen some literally on the edge of a pond. Here's a load of cuckoo flower showing its preference for wet environments. See if we zoom out and try not to get attacked by alarming blackbirds, which obviously objecting to my videoing. It's practically growing in the pond. I don't know what all these blackbirds are so annoyed about. I do work here. And also in the raw cliff area on the floodplain meadows in the kind of wetter areas. So it, it does like to have its feet wet. They like to grow in wetter areas. This uh, patch of rushes can attribute. You can see they're dotted well all around, even in the tussocks. That's interesting. I don't know what that was. Uh, we go. Cuckoo flower. Four petals again. Our fifth plant is also a member of the crucifer slash cabbage slash brassica family and this is garlic mustard. We've mentioned garlic mustard in a previous episode because it's a food plant for the caterpillars of the orange tip butterfly. It can grow lovely and tall. It's got those Tiny little white clusters of flowers, again the petals, four of them, little cross shapes, good one to look out for. The leaves are, uh, well, the plant book describes them as chordate, which is kind of heart-shaped. And they are sort of heart-shaped or triangular, uh, quite strongly serrated, kind of zigzaggy lined edges. And if you've got a decent sense of smell, which I have not, if you crush some of the leaves, then you'll get a, a little whiff of garlic. Not as strong as wild garlic, ramsons, but still noticeable nonetheless. So there you have it. There are five flowers to look out for that are pretty much... Super certain ID them without the need of a, a wildflower book or dissecting or taking them apart or even magnifying glasses. And sometimes you can even identify these things from uh, quite some way away. 
So before I say goodbye and wrap things up, we'll go back to Genghis, because apparently he has retrieved his dog. I remain sceptical, but I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, because I am tired and the chocolate cake is wearing off. Hello, Phil. Yes, uh, Genghis Marazapan here. Wildlife whatever. And uh, yes, second time lucky. Got the old dog back from uh, worrying the sheep. The farmer was uh, jolly understanding, actually. He only uh, pinned me up against the wall by my throat for, well, no more than five minutes, really. Um, so, I've got her back, and here she is. I've got her by the collar, so that she can't possibly escape. So here's Shesmerelda. Oh, what? Oh, goodness me. Shazza! 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 Back to you, Phil. Shazza! Shazza! And they said my deep cynicism was unhealthy. Well, that concludes today's episode of Discover Nature. Sorry, Socially Distant Discover Nature. Thank you very much to everyone who's contributed. Absolutely loved them. I'd like to finish off with something we received from one of our youngest contributors ever. So this is Rowan from Walthamstow, and he sent in these beautiful drawings of wildflowers, particularly important and one feature I particularly admire is in one of them you can see the seeds being shed from the pollinated wildflowers starting the next generation cycle of life continuing. Brilliant, well done, thank you very much for sending them in. If you'd like to send anything in or you'd love to see photographs, videos, anecdotes, artwork, definitely send in some artwork, absolutely love it. In Discover Nature people, you can find me at my usual Discover Nature email address. Everyone else, we should have the little banner appearing with our Twitter. And also, I always, never rolls off the tongue, ecosapienshow at gmail.com. That's how you can send stuff to us. If you've sent something in and it hasn't featured and you really wanted it to be in an episode, just send me a, an email prod, because like Jimmy's Bees, it might have just gone whoosh straight over my head or completely lost in cyberspace. So don't be afraid of uh, giving me a gentle nudge. What to do, what to do for next week's episode? Well, I have remembered that I have in the garage a moth trap. So this is a, a humane way of catching moths alive so you can have a little study of them and then let them go. In its simplest terms, it's a giant light bulb on top of a plastic box. It's uh, the most expensive light-up lunchbox you will ever buy. If it works, if it still works, I'm mm, not sure if it will, but if it does work and there's some nice weather, I'm going to put the moth trap out for next week's episode and we'll do a little bit about moth identification. If it doesn't work and the weather is horrendous, then maybe I'll do five more wildflowers that you can look out for. What a cop-out. Sorry, no, that's not very really compassionate. What an interesting alternative, Phil. Good save. Thank you very much for watching. Take care and take photos. See what's out there, send it in. Always love to hear from you. Goodbye. Genghis has finally tracked his hound down, so back we go. Hello, Phil. Yes, Genghis Morazapan here. Third time lucky with the old dog, uh, Shesmerelda, meeting her and all that. Got her back from the, uh, the sheep farm. Um, farmer was very decent, said he wouldn't shoot her until next time. So I'm pretty sure now that we're OK because got her sitting here, got her favourite treats. So she's not going anywhere. Oh. Ah. Okay, that's a bit of a disappointment. Shazza! Uh, Shazza! Shazza! <sighs> so the thing is, our, 
I'm all out of incredulity. I have no more incredulous looks for you. There is nothing left to give. I am incredulized out. So instead, all I can do is present <sighs> indifference. Yeah. Whatever, as the kids say, or not.